welcome and thank you very much for taking your time uh, to be part of World Voices Sunday Sunday afternoon. We are very, very honored here to have today two very, very special people um, from Hong Kong, Bernard and Jillian. I'll tell you a little bit more about them in, in a little while. Um, but before that, just a quick introduction on, on this session, uh, which is part of uh, the Answers series for World Voices. Um, this is a regular platform uh, which teaches writers from around the world and it gives them a space and a time to talk about their words and keep audiences and readers in Singapore updated with the the world. And this edition of World Voices is in partnership with the Uganda Writers Festival and support of the NUS Living Institute. Okay, now just a this bit um, you know, about uh, Verna and Jillian and, and Provers. Um, I'll give you a bit of a personal take on that because the first time I ever heard of Proverbs was way back in 2010 or 2009 in Hong Kong when I came across a very interesting book and you can look it up outside there afterwards. It was, it was called Poems of Hong Kong and Beyond called Smoke Pearl by, by an African poet who was based in Hong Kong and, and I thought it's, it was quite curious and quite interesting to find a book published in Hong Kong by a Hong Kong publisher um, on, uh, on this uh, you know, by an African. And, and I think any, any type of publishing and writing in English, it's it's always interesting for anybody who's in this industry and anywhere in the world. So I bought the book and I enjoyed it. And then ever since then, I, I, every time I, I, I visit Hong Kong, I, I, I look out for books by Progress. And um, the, the range of books that you can see outside there is the topics which Progress publishes is amazing. The range, they, they cover anything from a thriller, the reluctant terrorists, by uh, Hill Cohen, and, and then you have biographies of uh, Frederick Stewart, and you have books that deal with intercultural issues and cultural issues and, and, bi and, and biographies. And I think what is significant about Provers and that's interesting is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, any type of um, English, any, any publisher that publishes writing in English, original and new writing in English around the region, gives us an insight to what people are thinking and what people are doing and what people are saying and feeling. And in, in this sense, if, as I said, if you just take a look on, on the Provers website and, and the Rich outside, what Provers has done is actually opened up and created a new space and platform for a whole variety of writing in English, which otherwise might not have another platform anywhere around the world. So I think without much further ado, I'm very, very pleased to, to introduce to you Werner, who will first say a bit about publishing. And then um, Judith will talk about the Provers Prize and after which um, we will then we will read the both writers too. Um, Julian's a poet, and Werner has written a book on non-fiction book on um, you know several. So we are going to read it, and then after that we will open the floor for questions. So without much further ado, can I please introduce you, Werner. Well, it's a great pleasure for me in particular to be back in Singapore because many, many, many years ago, the first job that I ever had was in Singapore at Raffles Institution, where I was teaching for nearly three years. Uh, I can't quite believe it, but I taught English, but not only English, physical training, I can't have any of that. And later on, I, I went to the teacher training college, which was then in Patterson Road, and of course, eventually, it was absorbed by the by the university. So it's always a great pleasure to be back uh, in Singapore. Uh, it's a particular pleasure also to thank uh, William uh, for his arrangements, for his hospitality, and also, of course, to uh, Mr. Fan Bing Yang, uh, our moderator today. Uh, writers uh, struggle. Uh, to express themselves in fiction, in fact, or in poetry. And as publishers, and we think in a sense mentors, uh, Julian and I uh, must pay attention to careful editing, and, and not only to careful editing, but also to bindings, uh, blank leaves, blurbs, covers, puffs, write-ups, colophons, copyrights, dedications, dust jackets, end papers, errata, formats, illustrations, illustration processes, misprints, off-prints, paper, 
providences and punctuation. So it keeps us quite busy. We enjoy the busy uh, profession. I have to say that uh, as a fledgling author in Singapore very many years ago, I gave almost no thought, if any thought at all, to the travails, if any, of my publisher. It all seemed to be fairly simple to me at that time. One produced a manuscript, freshly typed, with a new ribbon, on a Remington or Olivetti typewriter. And when finished, one sent it to one's agent or direct to the publisher, who after a certain time, perhaps a year or so, uh, would dispatch to the author a set of what were then called galley proofs. These galleys were obviously not single deck flat vessels rowed by slaves or criminals or less depressingly ships' kitchens, but rather sheets of paper, printed sheets of paper, assembled for the author to correct. And these corrections would be made by the author and could include marginal corrections and additions in his or her own hand, varying from a few words to rewritten paragraphs. Following the receipt of these corrected galley proofs, the publisher would prefer a set of final proofs, usually stitched and wrapped, and send them to the author for any final corrections. The author would normally be expected to pay for such final corrections. The final proof, of, proof copy would often be used to promote the book. Book collecting, of course, is an interesting and book publication, if specialist, hobby, and also a business. And the earlier way of publishing, which I described, provided rich pickings. Others, irrespective of the content of a book, Collectors distinguish between proofs annotated by the author herself or himself and those others which bear at most the routine markings of the printer's or publisher's reader and in some cases no markings at all. Well, so much for the beginnings of publishing. We hope that our publishing house, Proverse, can attract many readers who are interested in the contents of the books we publish, and at least some who are interested also in the process by which they appear in public as finished works. My wife, Julian, is going to talk to you about the International Proverse Prize, one of the ways by which writers from around the world offer books to us for publication. She will also talk to you about the books and authors we have published. There are some copies of our titles available here this evening through the kind cooperation of select books in Singapore, our distributors in Singapore and Malaysia. You might like to have a look at them. I haven't actually seen them myself. If there are any there, I think there are. Uh, they are available for you to purchase uh, this afternoon, if you wish. And perhaps you would also like to consider entering for the Progress Prize in 2014 or in future years. Now, to go on with that, let me hand over to my wife, Julie. Thank you. 
think too fast, you can say. I don't think too short and fast because it's a lot of science. So this is the outline of the presentation, which is already very kind of being given by the moderator. So some details about the competition. Meet the entrants by their pictures only. Um, some of their books. And then we also show some of the covers of our other books, because we don't just get books to the prize, we get people who approach us directly. Um, we were asked to talk about our members and mentors. I think, generally speaking, that would be with the authors, because many of the authors are first-time authors, and so they don't really know what, what having their book published means. They don't know about the editing process. And so our authors, Fiction. 
fictional and semi-fictional autobiographies and biographies. If they say everybody has got a story within them. And autobiographical and biographical novels. So one person has written really about her husband who's passed away. Education polemics. So somebody who feels very strongly about some aspect of a, a, academia that has entered. transcripts of taped interviews as a fi fictional work. So anything is very, very interesting. It needs to be published in English, but it could be a translation into English. So we've tried to be as flexible as we possibly can, but there still have to be some parameters. Um, we didn't want to set the word length. But one of our honorary advice is, no, 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 you have to have a word length. And so we put the word lengths, but we have added other word counts are not ruled out. <laughs> so that should satisfy everybody. Those people who want to know a word count, and those people who don't. So the longest has been 110,000 words, and the shortest about 400. The 400 word one was a children, illustrated children's work. So some common questions. When was it established? Why was it established? Because we wanted to provide flexibility and to encourage writers. For example, Werner and I, probably there isn't a prize that we could enter because we don't live in England where we were born. And where we live, we weren't born. So, so we thought there must be other pe people in this situation who would like there to be a prize that everybody, as far as possible, could enter. So this is the fifth year. This is the fifth year of its administration. The closing dates, we have two closing dates. The first one is for the entry form, and there's a small entry fee, the entry form. Because filling in the entry form takes a lot of effort too. And so we want to give people, if people had to complete their work and fill in the entry form by the same date, given that people do things at the last moment, I think there could be some mistakes. So we entry form first, and that gives us time to see how many judges we need, because we see how many entries there are, and then the finished work. And you'd be surprised how many people, even though there is a month gap, write and say, oh, I haven't been able to finish. So the first books were published in 2010. So who are the founders? Here we are. We are the founders. That was a little while ago. Um, to emphasize the fact that it is an international writing competition, we've invited Distinguished and representative persons as our honorary advisors. One name you know very well, Edwin Tumbu, senior Singapore poet and academic. Poet from the Bahamas, David Crystal, very famous UK linguist and lexicographer, huge number of dictionaries he's compiled, and he's also a creative writer. Bjorn Jenwood, a Swedish linguist who's now living in the USA. Larry Smith, a cross-cultural advisor and journal editor, and Olga Weller, a Czech translator, poet, and novelist, who we have also published. The prize panel is anonymous. Why is that? Two very simple reasons. One is to preserve the integrity of the judging process. So nobody can know the judge find the judge and say, oh, by the way, my manuscript is called such and such, because the names are not in the manuscripts. And also to focus on the community writers and their limited work. So we don't want to give prominence to the judges, but to give prominence to the writers. Many entry entries will be published. Um, we aim to have one entry only. But so far, winning entry only, but so far the judges have been unable to decide on one only. So it's 
so far we have had two joint winners. So publication, publication is regarded as the main prize. There is this, a, a cash prize as well, the win, those who win and directly win the Provost Prize, and other excellent entries may be offered to supplementary prize, which is publication. It's from Hong Kong, 10,000. If you put it to arithmetic, work from the U the US dollars perhaps to Singapore dollars. No commercial sponsorship, but we do have very kind people who assist us, honorary legal advisor, accountant, advisors, agent and distributor, and honorary administrators. The judges are not paid. They enjoy the work and they enjoy the place where we where we the judging is done. And that's the place where the dragon is done and where we have just come from. <laughs> and it does, I like in Singapore, I suppose, it does shine. The sun does shine any every See a charming small village which does not speak English. But we'll try some. And some of the some of the entrants have written very nice comments. So the first one, Melamati Nanarami, is from the Bahamas. But she was born in Trinidad and Tobago. So she is in exactly that situation that she can't get support from the Bahamas where she lives. She can't get a grant from Trinidad and Tobago where she was born. Um, and the person who wrote the epic is LWLC. So these are very nice. So we feel that our idea has worked. It does address real needs and desires among those who want to write, because people do like a target and want to be published. So now, who are the successful entrants so far? Very quickly, I'm just showing you their faces and their books. There are some bullet points, but I don't think there's time to go through. But if you're very quick readers, you can read them. And this is his book. His book was really written by the toy Google, the family Google. He says it was uh, transmitted by brainwaves. The Google trans transmitted the book through brainwaves. It's really Google's own autobiography, a different way of writing an autobiography. Here's a gentleman whose book you mentioned earlier in the book. This is Nanamati Nanarami. Obviously an exceptionally talented woman because she's an engineer, a civil engineer. She writes most interesting poetry and she's also a graphic artist. So it's one of her artworks which is used for the cover. This gentleman is half Maori from New Zealand. And this is his, I think one copy of his book is like that. Concrete poetry you know, zigzagging across the page. So if he's using the word up, he will have you here and the P will be higher up to show it up. Um, this is Rebecca, she was joint winner of the inaugural prize. She's got three extremely young children, so she hasn't yet been able to finish the second novel, but she did, did make the first. The most interesting background is a really good story, but also you learn a lot about Jewish family life at the same time. She's married in his ring. So, a gentleman who's travelled the world. The photograph does not show his tattoos, but now we would not be able to show a neck without a tattoo. Wonder, lust, wonder, lust, and 
and get you fit. One of her colleagues said it's, it's, it makes it sound like in preparation for your feet. But she just means that she actually loves traveling. Emily, it's a very interesting background to a traditional Chinese family in Hong Kong. And this lady had an ice cream parlor. Unfortunately closed now because they raised the rent. She's, she's just finished the second book. And this is the ice cream parlor, a picture of her and the ice cream parlor and the back of her head at the end of the book. This is the epic writer. And it was illustrated by his girlfriend, very, very beautiful cover illustration. Originally, they did, the bodies of the boy and the girl did not have these lines. So I said, please, give them some clothes. Otherwise, some of the bookstores in Hong Kong will not, will not take the book. And these are the illustrations. They're beautiful, aren't they? Lovely illustrations. This lady was in Australia. She now lives in Andorra. And it's her first novel set in Andorra. So when, when she went to live there, she studied its history and customs and she wrote them into the background of the book. And Andorra writer has said it's a new departure. It's the first book in English um, about Andorra, which is a very small country, which is not just a travelogue. Kimmy Jones who wrote about her husband, who was a very excellent poet himself, and unfortunately had early onset dementia and Parkinson's disease. So quite a sad story. This is hers. Laura joined her the first time, and she's entered every time since. <laughs> Trying to repeat. <laughs> and that was hers. It makes, the cover makes it look as if it's for children, but if it's very readable by an adult as well, young teens and adults. And the second book, it's internet. So it's people make friends on the internet, and it's their letters through the internet. He was somebody born in Singapore, but he left when he was very young, and it's a very nice protective story set in ancient China. Really, really very excellent. James Norton is a prominent writer in New Zealand and he entered. Um, we didn't think this might be the end of his statue. David Biskin retired in Hong Kong. This is his novel. James Chen, first of the world, dystopia. The world is ending because pollution Man is the last human being. <coughs> but things end on a more optimistic note. That's his book. So he wrote a, a poetry collection. Peter Grimwell wrote an extremely accomplished thriller. That's his book. A proper thriller looking this lady was the ninth child in a large Chinese family, one of the indigenous families in Hong Kong. And very sadly, she passed away before the book was published. But her sister was very active and suggested to the university that she be given a posthumous PhD on the basis of the book. And so she did get that. Yes. Oh, I know. So you know her. Very good. Connection. Oh, Wonderful. <laughs> the sister is Stephanie Yu. And she's been very active indeed. And I guess since you know Stephanie, you would expect that. A very active lady. And so this is a book with a picture of the family. And so Sophie is on the end. And Stephanie is on the other end. You can 
will remember the Cambridge School Certificate, the then Federation of Malaya Certificate of Education, and the GCE Ordinary Level. The aim of the Scobie Bitty book was to help students prepare for the school certificate. Uh, the examinations that consisted of an essay, a short composition, an interpretation exercise, a tracy, and some general questions. Well, that book was published in 1959, before everybody in this room was born, <laughs> except me. And since then, I have been fortunate to have had over 30 textbooks and general books published by academic publishers such as the Oxford University Press, University of London Press, and general publishers such as George Allen and Unwin, the Radcliffe Press, and Macmillan, and Reader's Digest. My most recent books are memoirs, the first mentioned by Julian, Footsteps, Echo and the Memory, and the second most recent, Steps to Paradise and Beyond. Uh, I will give a short reading from Steps to Paradise, and a short reading from Footfall's Echo in the Memory, if I may. First of all, an extract from Steps to Paradise and Beyond. Paradise, incidentally, is Hawaii. Um, no doubt Singapore as well. In this case, Hawaii. And this is an extract. At 7.24 p.m. On the 4th of August 1961, Barak Hussein Obama II was born to Stanley and Durham at Kapirani Medical Center for Women and Children on the island of Oahu, Hawaii. On Barak's birth certificate, his mother's name is given as Stanley and Durham. His father's name as Barak Hussein Obama. His mother's race in the other document is given as Caucasian and his father's race as African. In 1973, when Barak reached the age of 12 and when he was still a student at one of the two extremely good schools in Hawaii, uh, I have to say that the educational system is not all that might be desired, but there are two superb schools, and one is Punaho, and Barak was lucky enough to go there. His mother, whose name was Stanley, uh, reached, uh, joined the East-West Centers Technology and Development Institute as a degree-seeking grantee. I have to say very quickly that the East West Center was established by the American State Department and it's funded by the state, by the, by, by the State Department. But it's situated on the campus of the University of Hawaii, which is funded by the State of Hawaii. So two very different funding agencies are involved. Well, Stanley lived off campus with Barak and her daughter, Maya. Understandably, she would have spent time with her children whenever she could free herself from her university studies in anthropology. In July 2010, the East West Centre celebrated its 50th anniversary, and this was a time of reminiscence. Academic papers were read, and discussion took place on a wide range of topics. One complete session was devoted to the mother of the newly elected President of the United States, whose half-sister, Maya Soitoro, because uh, Stanley married an Indonesian gentleman after divorcing her African uh, partner. And uh, the half-sister, Maya, spoke first, confirming that her mother, Stanley, 
was both artistic, she was a potter, and pragmatic, a tough person who nevertheless was easily moved. On the same platform as Soitoro, Anne Hawkins, a friend of Stanley's, told the audience in a tearful presentation that she first knew Stanley when both were volunteer workers in the mountains of central Java. She remembered Stanley as being rather frumpy in her field outfit, sandals, scarf, and glasses. Nancy Cooper spoke next and confirmed that she had worked with Stanley in Java's limestone hills. She noted that her friend had deliberately chosen a marginal area for inquiry, focusing on cottage industries and the entrepreneurial ambitions of the people working in those industries. Cooper observed that Stanley's skills, including the ability to use both qualitative and quantitative methodology and a simple writing style. Perhaps this was a style that she inherited from her teacher, Dr. Alice Dewey, and also from the British anthropologist, Professor Raymond Firth. Well, I think it's quite interesting uh, to realize uh, where the President of the United States, now with many, many, many problems, uh, came from, and it all began in Honolulu. My second extract is from my book, Footfalls Echo in the Memory, very quickly. On page 136 of that book, I mention the frequent broadcasts that I was privileged to make in those days for what was then named Radio Malaya, and also for the BBC's Far Eastern Station, then uh, focused, uh, housed on the same campus as Radio Malaya, which became Radio Singapore. Two programs for schools, there were many, were written by Professor Northcote Parkinson, or Parkin, as he was familiarly known by some in Singapore. Parkin taught some people who became quite famous in later life, including a very distinguished scholar living in Hong Kong today. He taught at the University of Malaya, now the University of Singapore, and he specialized in the study of conflict and trade in Southeast Asia. In 1954, however, he changed course, as I mentioned in the following extract. To the delight of colleagues at the university and elsewhere, he published an amusing article in the Economist newspaper. This mocked the world of business management by stating that work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. This article was reprinted in 1958 in a book called Parkinson's Law, The Pursuit of Progress, which became a bestseller, an unexpected bestseller worldwide. And because it was so profitable, it changed Professor Parkinson's life. Uh, there followed other books in the same mocking genre, in addition to serious books about business practices and some historical novels. I met Parkinson several times in Singapore, usually in relation to educational matters, but sometimes on social occasions. I remember talking to him once at a party held for some reason on somebody's roof. He told me, I never read newspapers, never, never, no matter where they're published. I can't quite believe them. And so this was the, perhaps one of the last words of Professor Parkinson, who unfortunately is no longer with us. I hand back to Julia. And also to our... Thank you very much.
in small groups, group by group. And then he learned, began to learn Cantonese. Um, so the poems I'm going to read, actually, because I'm not familiar with a Singapore audience, and I'm not quite sure what, what would be of interest. And so I thought, well, I'd start with family. And we've got family. So here's a poem about my grandparents. It's called Keep It From Memory.
And I worked with the students on writing a memoir about an old young family member. And she had a very striking phrase in her essay. And I, I took that then as a starting point for a poem called Past, Present. We miss the past because we came from there. People and scenes and places and ways of doing things. Old women lumping their lips in the sun. Old men eating their breakfast outside the museum heritage at Chantin. University students cherishing school friends from primary and secondary days. And I, do I miss the past too? Not yet. Not yet. I embrace the present in embracing you. But I surely know the past is where we also come from and where we're going to. Thank you, Thank you very much, my name is Julian Ritchie, for sharing the entire cross section of the industry from uh, publishing, literary press organizer, to non fiction writing and poetry, which is critical. The whole industry, one one hour. Okay, I think um, I think I, I think following Angelina's presentation on rice, which is very important in the sense it's encouraging on the writing. Um, I think at this juncture, I'd like to open questions to the floor. Are there questions which you would like to ask um, Jitin or Bernard in relation to I mean, firstly their roles as publisher and also literary advocates? Are there any questions you would like to ask? The joke for his uh, comment. So when it became a huge worldwide success, he was astonished. But of course they were grateful because then he became very rich. Well, I think it became a success because it's true. Sorry. It's true. Yes, it's true. yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we see so many examples of that uh, in the old life.
not toward them. It perhaps is not quite half of them, but a pleasing, a pleasing number have been supported by the Hong Kong Arts Development Council. So that's helpful. And um, for the authors, some authors have received royalties. Uh, so the, the contract provides for them to get royalties. Just as a, a very big publisher's contract comes. But we do find that with an unknown author, particularly if it's an unusual work, <coughs> it's very difficult to, to attract a very big readership. You may find people who like the works very much, but they don't want to buy them. <laughs> or, or they say, I wait for the e-book because they hope that will be, well, it is a little bit cheaper. And they do do, after the first print run, what I mean, I don't mean, I don't think there's only one print run, but after the print run, then we do do them as e-books as well. So, so our attempt really is to help expert works to be published, to cover our costs, and to make the authors know as widely as possible, as possible, within our own possibilities. And it does, um, it does require work by the authors if they really want to, to maximize the opportunity that we give them. They don't have to be shy about their own books. They need to tell people about their books. They need to tell their friends and ask their friends. But just like we were shy about promoting our own books, they also may be shy. So those authors who are not shy at all, who are really ambitious, um, and who think carefully and analyze how to maximize the opportunity, they sell more books. Right? So we have had a, a bestseller in Hong Kong recently, and that was an author who thought very carefully about how to do it, and spoke to us and we planned together how to, how to promote his book. And it was also of more general interest, it was a thriller. It was written as a commercial thriller. And he was right. Um, poetry doesn't sell well, but if poets give readings, then people like them, they like the poems, then that sells the books. So they're available worldwide. But for the, it's where the author is and who the author meets that actually is most successful in selling the books. So even though the, so the distributors, we have the Chinese University of Hong Kong Press is our Hong Kong and international distributor. Um, and everybody does what they can with the best will, with the best good will possible. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see what happens. But the important thing is that some writers who otherwise wouldn't have finished their work or who would never have been published have finished their work, excellent work, and it has been published and, <clears throat> and has been known. And it's surprising how things happen. So my first poetry book has been in one bookstore, had been in one bookstore in Central many years. And then suddenly, an Indian lady visiting from Boston bought it. And she sent me an email, which was a poem, to say how much she liked the book. So it, it doesn't have to happen immediately. Over time, you know, audiences may change. You may, you may get better known. Over time, as long as the book is available, your readership may finally come to you. And if you have a very energetic system, so Stephanie has done a great deal for Sophronia's book. So she has, um, so Sophronia's book was reviewed in, uh, in, in a Chinese daily in New York. And Stephanie spoke from the radio in New York. They had a reading. The equivalent of this in many social with the loft. So if you can get a team, if the authors can get a team of friends behind them to support them and work with us, that's the next stage of publishing a book, promoting it. I once listened to 
children regularly when the author says she spends a day to write a book and a year to do a book. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any other questions?